during this service. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Uyi. I have the pleasure of serving as one of our Connect Group leaders. Uh, shout out to the Med Center Group. I'm sure. Oh, wow. Y'all don't come to church? Wow, that's wild. Um, <laughs> so can I have everybody stand as we uh, read the word? Today, our scripture uh, will be Mark chapter 1, verses 14 to 28. All right. Later on, after John was arrested, Jesus went into Galilee, where he preached God's good news. The time promised by God has come at last, he announced. The kingdom of God is near. Repent of your sins and believe the good news. One day, as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, Jesus saw Zebedee's sons, James and John, in a boat repairing their nets. He, also, he called them at once, and they also followed him, leaving their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men. Jesus and his companions went to the town of Capernaum. When the Sabbath day came, he went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Suddenly, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit cried out, Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus reprimanded him. Be quiet, come out of that man, he ordered. At that, the evil spirit screamed, threw the man into a convulsion, and then came out of him. Amazement gripped the audience, and they began to discuss what had happened. What sort of new teaching is this? They asked excitedly. He ha it has such authority. Even evil spirits obey his orders, amen? Mm. The news about Jesus spread quickly throughout the entire region of Galilee. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Good morning, everyone. Uh, please have your seats. We want to say a big welcome to everyone. Um, we're so grateful that God has brought you uh, together with God's people. Um, we are uh, excited. And once again, we want to say a welcome to all those who are gathering and worshiping us for the first time. Let's go ahead and give them one more warm welcome, King City Church. Um, again, what we like to say is that our mission here is to love God, to love people, and to make kingdom disciples of Jesus in every field of influence. And so, um, as you heard, there's going to be a lot of, lot of information how we can continue to grow in our discipleship, meaning then that we want to learn what it means to become more like Christ, what it means to follow him. And so right after the service, if you want to hear more information on how you can get plugged in uh, to King City Church, there's going to be a membership class here, actually, in this auditorium. So don't be in a rush to leave. And, uh, but if you have things you have to do, then please uh, see the guys out in the Welcome Center. They scan the QR code, and we'll get you also um, plugged in. And so this month, uh, we, or at least rather for the past, past six weeks, we've been uh, joining in the, what we call the Lord's Prayer. And we ended that series uh, last weekend. So this weekend, we're starting a new series. And as you saw from the scripture reading, uh, we're going to be in the book of Mark. Uh, March, and we're going to go all the way from how Jesus calls his disciples all the way to the cross for eight weeks um, in the book of Mark, we'll be doing that all the way leading up to our Easter Sunday weekend. But again, before I jump into that, um, we want to say, how many people really were blessed by the worship this morning? Let's go ahead and give a, a hand clap. We want to say a thank you to our worship team. And yes, a thank you to uh, Minister Stacy Eggbold. Please, can we just celebrate Minister Stacy? Uh, uh, she has been such an encouragement to us uh, as a people, even way before uh, um, King City Church launched. Um, she was just super encouraging, always praying for us, was here on our launch day. This is her first time back since we launched a year ago, and we're just so happy to have her back. And so let's celebrate her once more, church. We are so grateful for her. Um, obviously, this is February, and the month of February here in the United States, we celebrate and commemorate what we call Black History Month, where we recognize and we celebrate the contributions 
that African Americans had to the building of this country. And um, we know that obviously in the schools and education systems, this is something that they're doing in their schools. But even for us as a church, we wanted to make sure that we highlighted this. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we um, wanted to uh, bring in Minister Stacy to sort of remember and remind us that the African or the Black History Month experience, and while we celebrate the contribution of African Americans, we understand that the African American history doesn't start with slavery, it starts with the journey back home in Africa. Yes, yes? can we get an amen to that? Yes. So the history of black Americans do not start with us in chains, and I say us, but it starts with us as African people. And we will not apologize for who we are. Can I get an amen? We will not apologize for who we are. And so this is the reason why we say let's celebrate the goodness of God in our native language, our native history, and at the same time welcome our brothers and sisters who have African American history so we can join arms together under the gospel tenet and tent that is big enough to accommodate all of us. And while us in the world we see strife, we see division, we as a church will lead the way for unity and reconciliation. Can I get an amen? And so with that said, while this weekend we celebrate the history starting from where Africa and African Americans originated, next weekend we'll be leaning into the African American experience through music as well. Because while we know that African Americans have contributed significantly to the building and the foundation of this country, we know that they've con significant, they've contributed as well, significant to America as a whole, to the world as a whole, through his music, through his entertainment, through his hip hop culture, and we can go on and on and on and on, but you didn't, hear, you didn't come here to hear that today. <laughs> but with that said, we know that there is space, even within the worship gatherings, but to honor what African Americans have done. And so with that said, next weekend, invite your friends. We'll be worshiping together with musical worship contributions of African American people and, uh, as we go in. But let's go right into the scripture. We're here in the book of Mark, and what we want to do for this eight weeks is to understand what does it mean to follow Christ? What does it mean to follow Christ? And for many of us who live in the social media age, when we hear the word following, we hear something totally different. We think following a friend, we think following a celebrity, but if you look at who have the most significant followers, so to speak, on Instagram, on Facebook, they're usually people of influence who have done things with their lives, right? Uh, and as a result of that, we tend to want to follow people we respect. We tend to want to follow people we idolize. We want to follow people who've made significant contributions in this world. We naturally follow them. Matter of fact, you see that they don't follow a lot of people. We follow them. We want to see their lives. We want to see what they're doing. We want to see how they play with their kids. We want to see what they're, how they, where they live. In other words, we follow people who we, we, we almost, should I dare say, worship almost sometimes. And the reason why then we will follow Christ then is if we see something of beauty in him, if we see something of, 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 of influence in him, in other words, to the degree to which we see who Jesus is, to the degree to which we appreciate what he had done, it's to that same degree that you have to lay your life down and follow him as he says. The reason why we have poor discipleship, John Thought says, is because we have a poor vision of who he really is. The reason why we, have, we feel that we have to be obligated or we think we have to be made to follow Christ because we truly don't know who he is. And so my prayer for all of us this morning, for the next eight weeks, as we look through the book of Mark, all the way from Mark 1 to Mark 16, and we won't read everything verse by verse, but we've, 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 we've organized it in a way that it starts from the call in Mark 1 and ends at the cross and the resurrection, rather, in Mark 16. And so I want you to continue to read this at home because one of the best markers of spiritual maturity and discipleship is personal Bible reading by yourself. And so don't let Sunday morning be the only place where you read the scripture. But when we read Mark 1 today, I want you to go read Mark 1 at home, read Mark 2 at home. And so that by the time you are journeying alongside with us in this series, you know exactly what we're talking about. So with that said, as we get fresh look, you may have heard some of these stories before, but I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit who we'll open our eyes, we have a fresh look into who Christ truly is. And through that revelation and that beauty, we get the power to follow him. 
And so Mark chapter 1, we're here in Mark chapter 1, and Jesus begins preaching in Mark chapter 1 and verses 14 and 15. The Bible says that Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God, preaching the gospel of God. Again, many of us, when we hear the word gospel, we think music. We think it's a branch or a genre of music. We have gospel rap. We got gospel movies. We got gospel music. But what did the word gospel mean? And many times, even I try to make sure I reorient even my own children. When we're at the dinner table, I say, what is the gospel? In a liturgical way, I say, I want them to hear me say it. What is the gospel? The gospel is what? And I want them to say good news. The gospel is not music. The gospel is not a genre of music. The gospel is not a genre of film. The gospel is what? It's good news. The good news of Jesus. The gospel comes from this Greek word called ouangelon, meaning a good proclamation, a good news. And so he came preaching the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in this good news. What is this good news, you say? The good news is this, that in Genesis chapter 1, God made you and I to be image bearers of him. He says, he made man and woman. He said, let me make them in my own image, in my own likeness, and let them have dominion over the earth. In other words, as image bearers, God's intent and purpose for our lives was that while he was God the king, he made us as co-regents, king and queen, Adam and Eve, to reign on his behalf, to flourish and to multiply and to, to rule the earth as he does in heaven, on earth. And so then, the gospel is that even though in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, we see then that the world was flourishing. It was in peace and what the Bible will call shalom. Everything was great. But Genesis 3 happens. And then we decide that we no longer want to rule on God's behalf. We want to rule on our behalf. We decide that we no longer want to have God as king. We want to be king without him. We decide that we no longer want to have the blesser tell us what to do. We want to do what we want to do when we want to do it, live our own truth, identify how we want to identify, and exclude and ignore everything he has said. We wanted the kingdom without the king. We wanted the domain without the one who gave and created us. We wanted the blessing and not the one who gave the blessing. And we said, in other words, screw you, God, if I can say that. We want to live life on our own terms. And we say, well, Adam and Eve, why would you do something like that? Well, guess what? We do the same thing. We don't want to live life on God's terms. Haven't you heard the language of our culture? Do you? I want to do whatever makes me happy. And this is exactly why. We have a disintegration of our world today. Everyone has turned in on itself, and that is the real word of sin, to rebel against God the King and live life on their own terms. And as a result of that, our relationship with God was fractured and our relationship with each other were fractured. The whole entire cosmos, if you will, was fractured because of our rebellion. But Genesis 3.15 happened. It said, and there is time a coming a time God tells the serpent that even though you've done this thing, devil, you will crawl on your belly for the rest of, it, for the rest of your life or the rest of eternity as it is on this earth. But someone is coming. The seed of a woman is coming, Genesis 3.15 says. And in that seed, the bruise, that there is going to be a, a where the, the serpent bruises his heel, but that seed of a woman will crush his head. Now, that's Genesis chapter 3, 15, and Mark chapter 1, verse 14, 15 says, repent and believe in the gospel, the very thing you and I lost, the dominion, the rule and reign of God. Jesus says, the time is now. I, God, incarnated in the flesh, Jesus will now come and bring the kingdom, the very thing that Adam lost, I'm bringing it back. And that's what the good news is. The good news is that, that despite you and I sin, despite our rebellion, Jesus comes in the person, God comes in the person of Christ, and he comes back on earth to begin to reinvigorate, to restore, to bring back the very thing that you and I lost. Everything that we experience 
on this world, in this world that is of disease and of death and of chaos, this month marks a year since Russia invaded Ukraine and was still at war. A few weeks ago, we heard the craziness of an earthquake that in Syria and Turkey that killed thousands of people. The world as we know it is broken because of our rebellion. But the gospel is that Jesus has come. And because he has come, he has come to restore our relationship with God, restore our relationship with each other. And let me pause here because many of us, we stop at chapter one, chapter two of that, where we say that, yes, Jesus has come and he's going to give you and I salvation. In other words, we can come into the kingdom of God as a family of God. And that is great news. Hallelujah. Praise God that we can be brought into the kingdom of God, not on our account, but on the account of Jesus. Not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done. Not because of our good moral efforts, but because of his good moral efforts. And because of what Christ has done, Jesus said the only way you come to the kingdom is to repent, in other words, turn away from your rebellion and believe in the gospel, place your faith in Christ and follow him. That's the way we come to the kingdom. And that is fantastic. It gives us an idea of how we ourselves are saved However, the church has done a great job of letting us know that we are saved by grace and faith in Christ Jesus. But what we haven't done a good enough job with this, that it doesn't stop there. The gospel of the kingdom of God is this, that even though Jesus had brought us into the family of God, the purpose that he has given all of us now is to go back out and to begin to do what he originally did in the garden, which is to have dominion over the earth ruling and reigning on God's behalf. And the gospel is also this, that even though he has given us the assignment now, there will come a time again where he will come again the second time, and on his second coming, he will restore our broken world. He will renew this world as we live in. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Many of us have been taught that the moment we give our lives to Christ, then, then that's it, pretty much. We're just supposed to wait here just waiting for the sweet by and by until God calls us home and then we'll evaporate into heaven and we'll live in heaven for eternity. But the gospel is this and the gospel of the kingdom is this, that no, we would be given new bodies, we'll be given new bodies and we will see each other and no, we will live here on earth, here on earth, a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. What is our job then at the church is to begin to point to begin to show a foretaste of what that new heaven and that new earth is going to bring. And this is precisely what Jesus does in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, we see him at the very beginning. He brings good news, a proclamation that the kingdom of God is here. I, the king, have brought the kingdom, not in its fullness, but I'm giving you a breaking in. This is Black History Month. And just a little quick of black history as to what the gospel really means. We all know that in this country, for 400 years, African immigrants were, were rather Africans were brought to this country and were enslaved. And for 400 years, were enslaved while the country of America was built in the process. And during the 18th, 19th century, there came some rumblings as to how slavery was going to begin to crumble. Where did this rumbling begin? It came from the church. The abolition of slavery came because men and women of God began to say that we cannot continue to do this because black people and white people and all people are made in the image of God. Where did the idea of human dignity come from? It comes from the fact that we were made in the image of God. It comes from the scripture. The problem, and this is the digression, I think, that we have sometimes, even in our world today, particularly as we see activist movements begin to claim and clamor for the lives that matter, is that sometimes we want to divorce our, our, um, our activism from the truth of the gospel. We want to march and protest without saying, well, where do we get these ideas from? And that's the reason why a lot of these times, if you see some of these movements, they eventually crumble. Because the ones that mattered when we have the abolition of slavery, the civil rights movement, the Harriet Tubman's of this world, the Martin Luther King's of the world, where do you think they came from? They came from the black church. It was the church of God that produced these ideas that the kingdom of God leads to a breaking in. It's not just about what we preach 
And we must preach the gospel, yes, but we must do it as well. Amen. This is where they came from. It came from a kingdom orientation that we cannot live and rule and see injustice around us and do nothing. But we'll get there. So Jesus begins to proclaim that the gospel is coming. The, the kingdom of God has arrived. And this, I think, is a great example of what this means. And so we all know that in 1862, Abraham Lincoln, the president of the United States, began to say, okay, in September of 1862, he, he sends a warning to the, to the Confederates and says, if you do not release the slaves, for, in January 1, 1863, slavery will be illegal in the United States. And he gave them three months to figure it out. So then, on December 31st, 1862, we saw a whole swath of African Americans gathered in churches. And then there were, of course, there were white Americans who, who believed and, and kind of came alongside them and joined them in that effort. And they began to watch the night, praying, looking forward to the time where freedom would happen. I said this at the watch night services. This is where watch night services became invigorated in this country. So all of us who gather on December 31st in our churches, that's the history behind it. That African Americans in churches were gathering and praying and anticipating and waiting for the freedom that was going to happen. In other words, the time was coming where freedom was going to happen. Likewise, the Israelites in that time were looking forward to this moment where the king, the messianic king will come and deliver them from the oppressors and the Roman oppressors. However, they thought that this king was going to deliver them from Roman oppression. They had no idea that the king that was coming was not a military king. He was coming to deliver them from the oppression of the, the, the spiritual evil forces. And we'll see that here in Mark chapter 1. However, as we go forward, we all know again, history tells us that even though that happened in history, 1863, January 1st, that there were people that still remained enslaved because they hadn't heard the gospel yet. They hadn't heard the proclamation yet. They hadn't heard the good news yet. But what, is, what happens? In 1865 in June, they send soldiers, thousands of soldiers to the south to enforce it. June 19, 1865, what we now call the Juneteenth is when thousands of soldiers came from the Union and says, we're going to enforce the law. And as a result of that, slaves were freed in the South. This is a little black history lesson. But we tie it back into the scripture. Jesus is the one who came from heaven to proclaim, yes, the gospel, but he came down to enforce it. He says, I'm coming in, I'm going to proclaim it, yes, but by the time I arrive on the scene, not only will I tell you the good news, I'm going to show you and demonstrate to you the good news. And so we move from Mark chapter 1 all the way down and begin to see him delivering people from demonic oppression. He walks into synagogues, he sees people who are held down and bound by the oppression and the chains of the spiritual world, and he begins to cast them out. As you go all the way down to Mark chapter 1, on to the Mark chapter 1 from 30 to all the 38th, he begins to exercise demons, he's healing lepers, he's, what is he doing? He's performing miracles. His miracles then are a demonstration of what it was before sin entered our world and a further demonstration of what it will be when he comes again on his second arrival and he brings a new earth and a new heaven and there'll be no more sin, there'll be no more death, there'll be no more decay, there'll be no more wars where we will all dwell and sit together as brothers and sisters here on earth. That is the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. Yes, we can clap if we're excited about that. But how does Jesus go on this kingdom assignment? How does he go on transforming the world? How does he do it? Does he do it with force? Does he do it with a military campaign? Does he do it with an army? No. Mark chapter 1, verse 16, tells us how he does it. He proclaims the gospel. He tells us what is happening. He tells us that the good news has arrived and he has come and he's bringing it. He's bringing a foretaste of it. He's bringing an idea of it. He's bringing a demonstration of it. Mark chapter 1, verse 16 says that Jesus comes and what does he do? On one day as Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon 
and his brother Andrew, throwing a net into the water, and they fished for a living. Verse 17 says, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. In other words, some version says, come, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And of course, as we go into verses 18 and 19, we see that he called another set of brothers, James and John, who were sons of Zebedee, and he called them to follow him as well. How does Jesus go on his mission of, of advancing his kingdom? He calls some disciples. He calls disciples. In other words, he begins to call people to himself in relationship with him, teach them about the said kingdom, and then equip them and empower them to go do the same thing. That's the mission of the church. When we say that we are called to be a church that loves God, to be an intimate relationship with him. And as a result of that intimate relationship with him, we begin to love people around us. And then we are now called to go make disciples, kingdom disciples, kingdom-oriented disciples that go into every sphere of influence and begin to demonstrate the kingdom's values. This is our mission, not made up by us, but poured in from the scripture, poured in from the Bible, that this is who Jesus, and this is how Jesus did it. Our mission is not a made-up mission. Our mission is the mission of Christ. He called disciples to himself and in intimate relationship with them, he begins to shape them, form them, teach them what it means to be a disciple, teach them about the principles of the kingdom. And in, in Matthew, we see the account of Matthew chapter 6, the Sermon of the Mount, and all the parables that he begins to teach them. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of God is like that. The kingdom of heaven is like this. He's teaching them principles of what the kingdom is. What does it look like? What does it look like if Jesus was king? What would it look like if he was the ruler of all of our lives? What would it look like if a people who was submitted to the rule and reign of Christ what does that look like for men who are fathers? What does that look like for men who are husbands? What does it look like for women who are submitted to the rule and reign of Christ in their, wife, in their, in their role as wives and mothers? And, and, and what does it look like for those of us who are at work to be under the rule and reign of Christ, bringing his influence in? He's teaching them that. And that's our mission here. We're going to do the exact same thing. And so he called the disciples to himself, and he's teaching them to resemble him, to know him, to love him, to become like him. This is what we call discipleship. Let me tell you, church guys, this. We're going to be discipled either way we want, because our spirit beings, were, we, we receive and we were made to worship, and we were created to follow people. And if we don't follow God, we're going to follow something. If we don't follow Christ, we will follow someone else. It's not a matter of if you follow somebody. It's a matter of who you follow. It's not a matter of what you follow. It's a matter of who you follow. We'll have been discipled by our social media feeds. We'll have been discipled by our cable television. We'll have been discipled by our video games. We'll have been discipled by our movies. We'll have been discipled, period. But the question is, who are we going to be discipled by? And the, Jesus says, follow me. Follow me, follow me, become like me, follow me. And then he reaches out to Peter and Andrew, the first brother brothers. He tells them, drop your nets. I want you to follow me. In other words, they leave their career. He tells James and John, who were, again, the son of Zebedee, he said, leave your father alone and drop your nets and follow me. Wait, 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 what are we saying? Are we saying then that following Christ means that we have to leave our careers and leave our families? No. Not necessarily, because we know that James and John and Peter and Andrew will actually go back to fishing. We actually know that Simon Peter will actually go back to his family because very shortly we will see that Jesus actually heals Peter's mother-in-law. But what was Jesus saying? He is saying this, that in following me, I want you to follow me so hard. I want you to follow me so passionately. I want you to follow me so intimately that everything around you and everything else pales in comparison to what you follow me. The reason why many of us struggle with idolatry, the reason why we struggle with anxiety and fear, because we have placed our utmost trust and our hope in those things. We follow our career aspirations and the a need to rise up the corporate ladder, and as a result of that, we're in anxiety when we're stressed out. We have the desire to be a husband, to be a wife, to be a father, to be a mother. And as a desire, we, we are 
anxious all the time when it's not happening. And even though those things are good things, Jesus is saying, I want you to follow me so actively that to, to, to leave everything else that's not necessarily mean you leave your family, to leave your careers, but means then that I become your most passionate, most intimate, and your most desirable pursuit. Why? Because it's in following Christ and in following and becoming more like him that we get the power to be the better husband. It is in following Christ and having our identity rested in him that we get the power to be the be better attorney. It is in following Christ and be more like him. Oh, and parents will tell you this. It's in following Christ and be more like him that you get the power to be a better parent. Can I get an amen? When you see how God has been patient with you, where you struggled, you see all the issues that you have struggled with and God has been patient with you, and you begin to see the same issues in your son and in your daughter, you say, oh God, look how you've been patient with me. I have to demonstrate patience with him. And if you, are, if you pay attention enough, and, I, and I'm speaking for myself, you will see character traits of yourself and your children. And if you're, if you're like me, you want to push them. You want to say, oh my gosh, you're so entitled. Ugh. You're so entitled. And then all of a sudden, you begin to think about your own life. Oh my, I'm just as entitled as him. Every time things didn't go my way, I cried. Every time things didn't go my way, I threw a temper tantrum. I may not see it. You may not see my temper tantrum, but I'm saying to myself, oh God, how can you let me go through this? Didn't I pay my tithe, God? Didn't I work for you, God? Didn't I do all these things for you? God, entitlement. God is saying, what did you do for me that I haven't given you? What have you worked for that I haven't given you? Please, please don't bring yourself pity to me. Everything you have and everything you own, I blessed you with it. Everything you do for me then is a response and appreciation of what I've given, not the other way around. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. But here's the thing. It is in the process of having an intimate relationship with Christ that he begins to tell you and gospel shape you that you get the power to be a, a, a good parent. But if you place your hopes and your identity of being a good father, you will drive that kid. Because why? You look to your children as your sense of identity. In other words, their success is your success. And if they fail, that's your failure. If you looked into your husband or to your wife for your sense of identity, then you, say, then you crushed them with your expectations. The same thing when you look to your work. If your work becomes your most dominant aspiration in life, then when you don't get that promotion, when you don't get up the couple ladder, you throw a fit, you're angry, you're anxious all the time. But Christ said, let me be your first love. Why? Because guess what? None of these things will ultimately satisfy your soul. I am the one you truly, really weed. I am the one you truly, truly long for. I am your first love. I am your king. Listen, in those days, pupils did not go by, or rather, master didn't call the pupils. The same way you and I in college, when we go to college and we go and we select and register for classes. How many of, you, how many of your professors picked you to be in their class? Raise your hand. Nobody. You picked your own class, correct? Matter of fact, if you're like me and you talk to your friends, okay, history, United States history, which one of these professors are going to give me the easiest way to get through this class? You pick your own professors. You don't, professors don't pick you, you pick your professors. Likewise, then pupils didn't pick, I mean, rather, the masters and the teachers didn't pick the pupils, the pupils picked the masters. But here do we see here, we see a master. The king of all the earth, the rabbi, he comes and condescends from heaven. Andrew and Peter and James and John don't pick Jesus. He picks them. Everything in our lives that we have is because of God's picking of us. The gospel is you don't come into a relationship with him by your own volition. He comes into a relationship with us and he calls us to himself. And Jesus is saying, this is the, the, the call of discipleship. The call of discipleship. He's calling you to himself, into an intimate, loving, personal relationship with himself. Because it's in that relationship that you will find the fulfillment, the security, the identity you need. 
in that relationship, then you get the equipment, if you will, to go be the better father, husband, daughter, son, student, attorney, physician, IT professional, whatever it is, and whatever field of influence he's called you to be. So he's saying, I want priority over your careers. I want priority over your family. Why? Because in giving me the priority, and following me so fully and so comprehensively and so unconditionally that all the relationships look and pale in comparison is in those relationships that you have the ability to satisfy your deepest longings. That the call of discipleship to come to him, come, follow me, the call. But that's not to say that it's going to be easy. It's going to be very, very challenging. It's difficult. It's hard. It's very difficult. The call to discipleship is challenging. We have to trust him. That is in him that our fullest, deepest longings will finally truly be met. Not in how much we have and not in how much we acquire, not in what we accomplish. It's in him. It's in him the call to discipleship, the challenge of discipleship. And the people listened to him and they said, my word, we have never heard anything like this before. Verse 21 and 22, the Bible says, Mark chapter 1, 21 and 22, it says, the people were amazed at his teaching for he taught with real authority. For some of you here, this might be the first time you ever heard the gospel of the kingdom narrative. By the way, this message of the gospel this gospel of the kingdom is the most central message of Jesus. Go check it out. Jesus talked about the gospel of the kingdom more than anything else in all of scripture. This kingdom orientation that we are made in his image, called to rule and reign on his behalf on earth, that's this most central message. And that how he saves us by laying his life down so that we can come to the family of God. And he's calling us to repent and turn away from our rebellion and follow him. That is his most central message. And then how he's calling us to be his disciples to now take on the earth and multiply the same way he called us in Genesis chapter 1 to make disciples of all nations to begin to rule and reign on the earth on his behalf. That is his most central message. That there is coming a time on his second coming where he came in the first time in his weakness. In his second coming, he's coming in strength and he's going to renew and restore this broken world. In other words, we can say, even though things look bleak right now, there's coming a time where Christ is going to renew and restore it all. And that's the reason why as believers, as gospel-centered followers of Christ, we are hopeful. We are joyful because we know this is not it. When you realize that this is not it, your anxiety, your fears, your depression takes a notch down. When you realize this is not it, then your desire to accumulate, 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 it, it, you lose the desire to be this person who always trying to accumulate. This is not the end. There is coming a better and a newer heaven and earth. He taught with amazing authority. The word authority has its Greek roots in author. In other words, an original author. Nobody came with this. He didn't copy it from him anyway. He came with original content. But even though he taught the gospel as we're doing this morning, and he explained the gospel as we're sharing this morning, he just didn't stop there. The Bible says in verses 23 to 28 and verse 27, let me read this specifically in 27, he said, and they were amazed, yes, at his teaching, but he sees a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an evil spirit. And he cast that demon out with a word. The demons begin to converse with him and he says, you're here, O holy one of God. By the way, at that time, no human being knew who Jesus truly was. It was a demon that saw who Jesus was and began to tremble at what he says. And by the way, the Bible says that he cast the demon out and he told the demon to shut up and keep quiet because he didn't need demons going around sharing his message. He wanted the disciples to. And as a result of that, the people were amazed, not only at his teaching, they were amazed because they looked and debated about themselves. This is verse 27. They were amazed because 
They said, this is a new teaching with authority. And then he commands the unclean spirits and they obey him. We see that miracles play an important role in the gospel. And Mark will record over 17 times that Jesus did miracles, performed miracles. What was he doing with his miracles? Was he trying to show off? Was he trying to impress us? No. He was trying to denote the breaking in of the kingdom and how in the breaking in of the kingdom, the reign of Satan was going to crumble and establish the reign of God. He was denoting the reign of Satan breaking down and establishing the reign of God. So in other words, he taught about the gospel. He preached about the gospel and he began to demonstrate the gospel. And this is also what the church is called to do. It is not enough then to talk about the gospel and talk about how it's for our individual salvation. Yes, that's the first part and we must celebrate that. But in the end, we must go out. He's called us to be disciples to go out and begin to demonstrate it, to show forth it. In an article recently released by Timothy Keller, he wrote an article in The Atlantic. They, they, they're talking about why the church is in decline in the West and why the church is in decline in the U.S., and he says that how then do we get the church to begin to get revitalized? And he has some recommendations. The first one he says, what we just talked about, is that we should begin to proclaim and teach the gospel's narratives in a way that the people of the West can understand. In other words, to contextualize it. Not lose the message of the gospel, but contextualize it in a way that our generation can get. But on the other hand, he writes, that we need to be able to marry the gospel's proclamation with the gospel's demonstration. And he says, this is Tim DeKeller, renowned theologian, uh, chairman of Redeemer City of the City, and just amazing, brilliant author. He says, I've heard that, he said, the he said, that you as church can grow again if they learn to unite justice and righteousness. I've heard African American pastors use this terminology to describe the historic ministry of the black church. By righteousness, they mean, he says they because he's Caucasian, <laughs> um, they mean that the church has maintained its traditional beliefs in the third of the Bible, morality and sexuality. It caused individuals to be born again, yes, through faith and the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. But by justice, they mean that the church has to have an activist stance against all forms of oppression. He's saying that the black church had modeled this historically. He said, while Protestant white churches tend to pick one or the other, liberal mainline churches tend to focus, like liberal mainline churches, they mean by the Methodists, the Episcopalians, and uh, um, all these other mainline denominations, tend to focus primarily on um, justice, social justice, social justice, social justice. But they s ignore sometimes the authority of the scripture and divinity of Jesus and his bodily rest. In other words, in, in the liberal camp, there's a sense where there's a lot of debate on if the Bible inerrant and whether or not the, the Bible has authority in our day and time. But on the other hand, on more conservative evangelical sides, they tend to do really, really well with proclaiming the Bible and declaring the inerrancy of the scripture, talking about who Jesus is, but they turn a blind eye when it comes to justice. And we're seeing this even with the Southern Baptist Convention where we're seeing splits and fractions over this issue. In the SBC, we see that on one end, there were people who were leaving the SBC because they thought they weren't strong enough on the issue of social justice. And then when you look into again, you see that when they elected a president on SBC, this is all within the last year, by the way, the SBC elected a president on the issue of social justice. And as a result of that, you saw people leaving the church because they said the church and the SBC had gone woke. They're moving leftward, they say. We cannot be a part of the SBC anymore because they identify with social justice. And Jesus is saying, why? Why do we have to choose between justice and righteousness? Why does it have to be an either or? In Christ, we see he proclaimed the gospel, and then he demonstrated it. It's not an either or. It's a both end. It's a both end. And this is the reason why here at the church, just this week, we went to Orlando. And we were looking at our demographic survey, the, 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 the skill mapping survey that we asked everyone to fill out. And if, if Tolu can just kind of put that on the screen real quick, we saw that in our church, we have a demonstration of all our skill sets. 
For those who fill it out, we can see that we are predominantly a people of professionals in the high T healthcare field and business and entrepreneurship. And so we're saying to ourselves, how then, as a church, do we marry who we are to what we can do? How can we be on mission to serve our city, to serve our community? Because in the end, while this is good and we must come in, we must definitely go out. I like one of the church that they invited at uh, the church in Pittsburgh um, called Bible Center Church. They're a church of 150 people, but they're doing an incredible work in urban Pittsburgh with after-school programs and tearing down drug-infected buildings and doing amazing work. We got their contact. We said we're going to come follow them and see what exactly they're doing. Because in the end, we must proclaim the gospel of Christ, but in the end, we also must demonstrate it. We must demonstrate it. And so I love what the pastor, his name is Pastor John Wallace. He says that a lot of times in the church, we teach the church as Super Bowl Sunday. We come in as a production. It's, it's the lights and everything is great and the amazing worship and all that. We are Super Bowl Sunday. We treat the, Super, the church service as though that is the game, not realizing that the, that's the halftime. That's halftime. Last week, Sunday was Super Bowl. Many of us, a lot of our women, I must just say, don't care much for the game, but they were, oh, they were, could not wait for the halftime. <laughs> many people watch the Super Bowl just for the halftime. Likewise, likewise, many people come to church just for the halftime. This is halftime, folks. The game is out there in the end, he says. Yes, we can clap. If you can clap. What does a halftime fall for the players? The halftime is when the players huddle together. They get encouraged. If they're losing, they say, jock it up, man. We're going to do this. They get, they, get, they get encouraged. They give all these motivational speeches. We can do this. Yes, we can do this. If we're down, we're going to come back up. We saw that happen last week. Kansas City was down by, I think, with 14 points. They come in, and then boom, they win. I'm not saying I was rooting for Kansas City. I'm just saying what happened. Now, now. It just happened. They came in and they took over. Why? They went into the halftime, huddled over, got some strategies, and they came up and they blew away with Philadelphia. That's the purpose of our Sunday gatherings. Our gatherings are halftime to do what? To encourage each other, to equip each other. But eventually, we must get back on the field. We got to get back on the field. Where churches struggle is where they begin to think that Sunday is the real day. No, Sunday is equipment time. Sunday is encouraging time so that we can be equipped with the proclamation of the gospel's message and we can go out as his kingdom disciples in every field of influence and begin to demonstrate what the rule and reign of Christ is. But where do we get the power? Where do we get the strength? We look to Christ. He tells Peter and he tells Andrew, leave your fishing. It is in Christ Jesus we see he left the glory of all the heavens and he condescended to a world like ours that was broken and muddy. He tells James and John to leave your father while he's fishing. But it was in Christ we see the one who was in internal intimate relationship with Christ, with God the Father, leaves the heavens, leaves his father and come down to on earth. And on the cross, he will be nailed naked with a sense of abandonment, cosmic abandonment of his father on the cross, Jesus would not cry, my legs hurt. Jesus would not say, my leg, my leg. He wouldn't say, my hands, my hands. Neither would he say, oh my gosh, look how these people left me. He said, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why was he abandoned? Why was he left? He took on our sin, your sin, my sin, so that we could be brought into the family of God. He was abandoned so that we could be brought in. He was crushed so that we could be crushed. That's the person who loves you, and that's the person who's calling you to follow him. Will you follow him? He was crushed so that we wouldn't be crushed. He was left out so that we would not be left out. Let us stand to our feet. Let us stand to our feet. The call to discipleship, the challenge of discipleship, and the cost. It will cost us. It will cost us our time. It will cost us our money. It will cost us our skills. It will cost us our talent. It will cost us our ability. It will, in some cases, in some parts of the world, it will cost our life. And so I want all of us all over the building to just begin to talk to God wherever you are. Say, Father, I'm responding to your call to follow you. 
And if there's someone here who's saying, I've never given my life to Christ, I've never placed faith in Christ before, or even if you have in the past, you're saying, I want to return back to the place of faith in Christ, we will have people here down who are going to be praying with us. We want to ask that in this moment, begin to talk to him for the next couple of minutes. Say, Father, I want to follow you. Whatever it takes, whatever it takes, I want to follow you. As we look to your love, as we look to what you've done, as we see how you laid your life down, as we see how you left your father, left your comfort zone for us, may we receive the power, may we receive the grace, may we receive the strength, may we receive the courage to follow you. Yes, to proclaim your good news to the world and to begin to demonstrate it to the world. Whatever you are, begin to share that in your prayers as the worship team leads us in the choir. Your love is patient Cause you feel my heart With so much peace and joy Your You're amazing, amazing. You make my life feel brand new. Jesus, you love me too much. Oh, I can testify. Jesus, you love me too much. Oh. Just testify with us. Your love is patient. Whatever you need, whatever you need, He fills your heart. Come on, receive it right now. So much peace and joy. And we can declare over and over again that He's amazing. Yes, yes, in your life, you make my life feel brand. Your promises and your promises are yes and amen. You're not a man, you never lie. So we come with the truth this morning. Jesus, you love us too much. Oh. Somebody just declare it, declare it, declare it. Say it again. I want you to say, Jesus, I love you too much. Oh. Just tell him. Because it's a, it's a love relationship. Come on, tell him, I love you. I love you. I love you. Say it again. Jesus, Jesus, I love you too much. Oh. Too much. Oh, excess love. Oh. And so, Heavenly Father, that is our heart cry this morning. That in response to what you've done for us, in response to how much you've loved us, in response to how you've demonstrated your love on the cross on our behalf, in response to how you invite us in, not because of our good works, not because of our moral efforts, but rather because of your goodness, that we as a people, we will love you with all of our hearts all of our minds and all of our doing, all of our beings, everything we have and all that we are, we will give to you in worshipful response. 
because of what you've done. This is our heart. This is our prayer. We pray and ask all of this in Jesus' name. And amen. If you believe that, let's go ahead and celebrate God for his goodness and his love on our behalf. And Father, we pray that as we leave this place, we will leave with an orientation and a consciousness of your presence. That you've called us to be a kingdom of priests. That we will go into the world teaching your gospel, proclaiming it, but yes, demonstrating it as well. May you give us the strength, may you give us the power, may you give us the courage. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. And amen. And amen. You've done so much for me, and I cannot tell it all. So we say, So I said, I make it to go to the when you heal, you heal completely.